Are you ready to go? I don't mean leave. I mean look into God's word. Are you ready to go? Yeah. All right, I, I, I don't want you to think so much of this as a, a preaching event, as a, a, a Bible study. We are together, we are gathered to get, gather around God's word, and we are looking at the very important and very practical subject of faith. Because the object of your faith determines the direction of your life and the focus of your desires. You are what you love. And you love what you believe will bring you the greatest happiness in life. So let me pull this out of my pocket. Do you recognize this? Let's say that the object of your faith is a Snickers bar, or bars, that you believe your greatest happiness in life is eating these Snicker bars. And so what that means is you're going to organize your life around eating Snicker bars because you're a follower of Snickerism. You're a Snickerist. And the object of your faith, your eternal destiny, is this. Now I say this because what, your, what faith is to your soul, oxygen is to your body. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's your activating principle. A sticker bar, if, if that's what you place your faith in, is, is your activating uh, principle in life. A and so, because of that, you not only organize your life around the Snickers bar, but you derive your identity, your purpose, your meaning, your significance from this Snickers bar. And today, we want to look at what Christianity has to say about both the object of our faith and the extent of our faith and how we can grow our faith in Jesus Christ. And to do that, every single week in this series, we're looking at one chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Because Hebrews chapter 11 uh, involves not just one story, but story after stories of ordinary men and women just like you and me that exercise faith in the living God. And so we want to tease that out. We want to see what uh, that has to teach us. And today, we come to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. And this is our third case study, and it's now the case study of Noah, the famous builder of the ark. And we're going to read verse 7, and then we'll go back a, a little into the lengthy treatment of that story in Genesis chapter 6. But I want you to stand with me now as I read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, notice that paragraph after paragraph begins with the two words by faith. By faith, now Noah, he's our case study, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. You may be seated. Now today I want to do two things. I want to talk about faith and I want to talk about Jesus. I'm going to look at what Noah teaches us about faith and what Noah teaches us about Jesus. And I am really so excited about this because this is such a marvelous section of God's Word. So I see a couple of things here in our Bible study together, that this time together, that we can learn from Noah uh, about faith. And the first is that faith isn't just um, ideas about God, it's dependence upon God. But don't misunderstand this. Faith, in terms of the Christian faith, isn't an anti-intellectual blind leap for people who are weak. Faith begins with thinking. 
Faith begins with reason. We see this in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Christians are people who have thought deeply about creation, who, who understand that God has created the universe, that the universe didn't happen by chance. And because God is created and because God is at the center of the universe, we live in a personal, not an impersonal world. And that makes a total difference in how we live our lives. And we get there through thinking. At the center of Christianity, uh, there are ideas. At the center of Noah's faith, for that matter, uh, there are ideas. Yet what's interesting, talking about our culture for a moment, is one of the things that keeps people from come, becoming a Christian today, coming to Christ, is they're unwilling to think. To think it through. To think. They'd just rather drink and have fun. But the approach of Christianity is very different. It says, come and think and reason and measure. But faith is more than thinking because Christianity is more than ideas. Christianity is a power. It's Romans 1.16 that it is rooted in a personal, miracle-working, infinite, perfect, creator, king, God, who is at the center of the center of the core of reality. So faith is also a, a, a dependence. And, and commenting on, on culture again, not only do people not come to Christ today because they're unwilling to think, uh, people also don't come to Christ today because they're only willing to think. <laughs> and Jesus says over and over in the New Testament, no. You must not uh, only believe about me, you must believe me. My deity, my majesty, my glory, my, my lordship, my, my wonder, my love, my compassion, the forgiveness I offer you, and you must let me into your life. And by faith, you have this opportunity to experience the power I offer you in the residence of the Holy Spirit as you look to Christ. This life-changing union Jesus offers us. Do you know that to be a Christian means you have a union with Jesus Christ? That when Christ died, you died. That when Christ was raised from the dead, you were raised to life. So Paul says in Galatians 2.20, uh, um, For I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We have this union, this communion that the Puritans used to call it in Jesus Christ. And all this to say faith is experiential dependence uh, on the real-time power and presence of Jesus. Now, all this to say, when we read the first three words of verse 7, by faith Noah, faith is both cognitive and experiential. It's ideas and daily dependence. Uh, think about Noah. Noah staked his life. on the existence, on the reality, on the presence, on the power of God, even though it seemed crazy. Even though he had to stand alone. I have this picture, if, the doctor, if a doctor had come to Noah, Noah and said, hey Noah, you have uh, you know, this incurable heart disease and you only have three weeks, Noah would have said, uh, okay, and he would have lived a glorious three weeks. Because he staked his life on a real time, a real presence of God. You see, God isn't just a collection of ideas. God is the most perfect, the most beautiful being in the universe. So Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Now unto the king, 
No one knew he wasn't the king. He knew God is the king. Do you know that? Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I mean, think about what Paul is saying. Think about the beauty and the perfection of God. He's eternal. There has never been a moment when God's administration hasn't ruled the universe. There will never be a moment when God will be not ruling over the entirety of our lives. But God is also not just eternal, God is immortal. Uh, God won't back off, God won't make mistakes, God won't get tarnished, God won't um, retreat in pain. He won't die, he's invisible, he is, he is so wondrous, so majestic, so big, if I can say that, that he is invisible. He's the only wise God. Now unto him be the honor and the glory and the power forever. Moses had a sense of the perfection and the infinity and the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God. Do you? Faith for him wasn't a collection of ideas. It was active daily dependence in this and that uh, when no one would stand with him. Just beautiful. Uh, the second thing as we continue our study is I want you to see that faith, uh, uh, according to Moses, is taking God at his word. So the story is told in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. And as I said, let's sneak back to Genesis chapter 6. And we can't read much of this wonderful story, but we can read some significant pieces. So I'm going to begin in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. We'll have the words on the screen. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God. Oh, that God would say that of me and of the people of Wheaton Bible Church. Verse 12, God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is you, how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. That's about a football field and a half in length and four stories high. And then verse 19. You are to bring into the ark two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. And finally, verse 22. And Noah did everything. If you're following your Bibles, underline that, circle that. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. Not just a few things, but everything. Now here, if you, if you think about it, what's going on is that God is announcing that the stock market's going to crash and it's never going to recover. Uh, God is saying every economic ecosystem in, in, active in Noah's day is going to fail. There's a nuclear disaster coming and everybody is going to die. That's what God is announcing. And it's something that Noah had no categories for. Furthermore, God is calling Moses, com command, did I say Moses, commanding Noah to build this ark in the middle of a desert region. It's sort of like you building an ocean liner in the state of Nebraska. I, I, I mean, who does this? Yet what did verse 22 tell us? Verse 22 told us that God, or Noah did everything God commanded. Noah took God at his word. That's what we see here, even when his word seemed absurd. Counterintuitive, countercultural. And, and the question we've got to ask is why? why? Why was Noah like this? Why did uh, Noah do this? And we are given the answer in verse 7. It's two words in verse 7 because Noah was gripped by holy fear. Noah, we are told, built the ark in holy fear. So what does holy fear mean? First of all, it means focus. He had a laser-like focus 
on the word of God. But second and more broadly, it means he had an underlying respect and awe for every single word God spoke. And so, friends, because I love you, I want to say to you this morning, to be a Christian is to be Noah in your respect for God's Word. It's to believe that the Bible is absolute truth. It's inerrant, as we say, and and that's a fancy word that means it's without error in their original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. It's to believe when God speaks or when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And I wonder this morning, do you have that holy fear for God's word? Is it the skeleton, if you will, the spinal column of your life? Well, let me tell you a regrettable story. Uh, I was living in the city of Dallas. I was in uh, grad school. I was busy in a, a ministry called Young Life. And uh, to make some money, I had a couple part-time jobs, and one was taking care of an older lady's yard. But because I had so many things going on, and I was learning Greek and Hebrew, and who in the world can learn Hebrew, um, I was really distracted when it came to her yard work. And one afternoon, she came out and talked to me because I lived in a little garage apartment in her backyard. And she said, hey, Rob, I've got this. And it was a gallon or a gallon and a half of weed killer. And she said, we've got this grass problem and weed problem. Uh, They're encroaching into my flower beds. And I want you to wind the way uh, around the flower beds and use this weed killer so we can stop this. And she said, by the way, this is really strong stuff. This is stuff the Texas State Highway Department uses. And so I wish I could tell you this has a happy ending. <laughs> but I was in a rush, and as I'm sometimes prone to do, thinking I know more than I do, I didn't read the directions carefully. I put the weed killer down around all the beds, are beautiful uh, beds, and three weeks later, every single rose bush, every single bush, every single tree in those beds were dead. And I had killed them. Because I didn't read the directions. Faith is taking God at his word. Which means we not only read the directions, we follow the directions because we love the directions. We understand the directions in God's word, the wonderful stories in God's word, the emphasis on Jesus in God's word is light and and life. It's what Hebrews calls holy fear. So when the Bible says to you, Christian, don't judge. Instead, forgive and, and, and love. Or advocate for the justice of uh, uh, children, like we saw in the video, or, or the poor, the needy, the distant franchise, or stand for life, or give generously to the kingdom of God, or take that risk and, and lift up the gospel, tell your story to, to someone around you who is hurting. When the Bible says never cut the relationship uh, between sex and permanent total commitment and marriage, When the Bible says pray, when the Bible says uh, read the Bible, or love the Lord your God with all, 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 your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. You're not selective in your obedience. You're not perfect. Uh, But you're making progress on, on complete obedience to God. Noah, Genesis 6, verse 22, did everything. God commanded, not perfectly. And today it's important for me to say uh, the reason this is so difficult for us and the reason often as Christians in the church, a church like ours, we're selective in our obedience is because today our culture tells us uh, the doorway to freedom is living independently. But the Bible says time out, wrong. The doorway to freedom is submitting willingly to to the authority of another 
Because you are not in control, God is in control. And, and to the extent you understand you are a danger to yourself because of your sinful heart, and you submit to, to the, the wisdom, the love, and the grace of God in, in Jesus Christ, you will overcome the human tendency to self-destruct. We see it all around us. And you will overcome your greatest temptations in life because you're in submission to the authority of God. And that's not an ugly thing, that's a beautiful thing. And it's at its center, the source of freedom. Now let me uh, say one more thing about Noah's faith and then we'll move on to Jesus. Uh, the last thing I want to point out that we learn about Noah is is that Noah, that faith means refusing to be defined by what you see. Now, now take yourself back in your mind to Noah. Do you think Noah saw a big storm front coming when God issued this command? No, nothing had changed the moment after God spoke than the moment before. Uh, people suggest that Noah built this ark decade after decade. Some people said he did it over the course of 100 years. And no visible signs that a flood was coming. But Noah wasn't defined by what he saw. And we see this in verse 7. Look again at chapter 11, Hebrews, and, and verse 7. How did Noah respond to God's warning? What was God's warning? He responded positively to this warning about things that Noah could not see. So uh, let me ask you a question. What defines you? Is it, for example, your wounds, your problems, your pain, which you can see? Or Jesus' wounds, his forgiveness, his love, which you can't see? Uh, you're, you're in debt, or you have financial weakness, or maybe it's the opposite for you. You have all sorts of financial strength. Uh, what defines you? Your, your debt, your weakness, or your financial strength, which you can see? Or the debt Jesus paid on the cross, incurred on the cross, dying in your place for your sins, which you can't see? What defines you? Your performance, your accomplishments, your successes, which you can see? Or Jesus' performance? Jesus! accomplishments as he stretched out on the cross for you, which you can't see. Where do you think that real freedom, contentment, acceptance comes from? In what you can see or what you can't see? So you rest in the love and the wonder and the security and the protection of Jesus. Now let me just talk for just a second about approval as it relates to this. Let's say you're a sophomore in high school. And like any sophomore in high school, what's really going to matter to you is the approval of friends that you can see. Now if you're in your 70s, the same is true. What is important to you is the approval of people around you uh, that you can see. Can you imagine the opposition, the, rec the rejection, the disdain Noah experienced as he built this ark? We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2 in just a moment, and there we learn that Moses wasn't only a general contractor, he was a preacher of righteousness. Now what that means and why that's significant is as Noah was building the ark, he was preaching, inviting people to turn from their sin and, and, and trust God. And the implication is the ark would have been available for anyone who believed, and no one, not one, took up the invitation. Can you imagine the, uh, the emotional toil, the angst that Noah lived with constantly? Now, maybe relative to approval, Noah was just one of those guys that didn't need approval. Or maybe, on the other hand, he was a guy that really needed approval, so God uses this construction project as an extreme makeover of his heart. Uh, we don't know, but what I can say to you 
is if you have a deep need for approval that's unchecked, then in certain moments of your life, that is going to make you insecure, that is going to make you weak, and you're going to either withdraw and self-pity or, or compromise and go along with the flow because you want the approval of others. And if, in addition, you don't find that approval, you don't get that approval uh, from people that, like, like Noah certainly did, didn't get, uh, then what happens is that makes you uh, demanding, it makes you angry, it, it, it makes you all churned up on the inside. And you'll lash out. Or you're going to get very, very depressed. Now, don't misunderstand. God has created each and every one of us for relationships, for community. It's the beauty of the body of Christ. But what I'm saying is if you try to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul for approval with what you can see rather than what you can't see and rest in the wonder and the accepting love of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, then the waters are always going to be rising. And you'll feel like you're drowning. One of the most beautiful things about Noah here is that uh, uh, Noah's a guy who didn't much need the approval of others because he was so content in the approval of God. Is that you? Now let's go on. Let's move from Noah's faith to Jesus' beauty. And let me begin this conversation by uh, saying, and I, and I assume you get this, but it's important to uh, remind ourselves that this story of Noah isn't about Noah, it's about God. Uh, Joshua isn't about Joshua, Daniel isn't about Daniel, Dan uh, Nehemiah isn't about Nehemiah. Ultimately, every single story, uh, the story of Noah is, is about God. Uh, God is the main actor here. God is the one that determines the flood. God is the one that commands Moses to build an ark. God is the one that commands the animals to go into the ark. God is the one that shuts the door of the ark. God is the one when the floods have receded, who opens the door of the ark. God is the one who promises he will never bring a, a flood like that again. God is the main actor. But when we come to the New Testament, there's something uh, that happens, something Jesus says that often we as followers of Christ miss. And that Jesus says twice in Luke 24 and in John chapter 5 that the entire Old Testament points to him. That this story, these stories point to Jesus. So Jesus says, for example, in Luke chapter 24, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in the entirety of the Old Testament. So I want to show you here the beauty of Jesus because I don't want you to come out of here thinking, okay, now i got to huff and puff and try to be, by, be like Noah. No, I want you to say, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to give myself uh, to God unconditionally because of the beauty of what he has done for me in Jesus. And the first way we see this three ways quickly is that Jesus Christ is the greater Noah who doesn't just experience a flood, but sends final judgment. The Bible tells us over and over, God is holy, and God hates sin, and God will judge sin. We see this in the flood. That's the, one of the points of the flood. A couple chapters later, later, we see it in the destruction of the Tower of Babel. A couple chapters after that, in the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, some time goes by, and we see the death of an entire nation of Israel because of their unbelief in the wilderness. Some time goes by, and we see the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, and then the southern kingdom of Israel, and then the Babylonian captivity, all acts of judgment on God's own people. Then at the cross, on the cross, Jesus himself bears the judgment of God. 
all of this, starting with the flood, points to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the final judgment of all the living and the dead. The story of the flood points to that judgment. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what Jesus tells us, lest you think I'm making this up. So turn to Matthew 24, or look with me at Matthew 24. Just a couple of verses here. I'm picking it up in verse 37. Jesus is speaking, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now see the link? For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus says you don't understand the story of the flood unless you understand it's a picture of my final judgment. Now, uh, let me just say, in terms of our culture, really this is also very modern. Because we live in a world today in the West that hates that disdains injustice. So even secular atheists hate racial, economic, uh, political injustice. And so do we as followers of Jesus Christ. But because of our biblical commitments, uh, we also hate injustice uh, uh, towards the infirm, euthanasia, or or to the unborn in, in, in abortion. We hate the discrimination of Christians because of their stand for Jesus Christ. We hate the unraveling of the traditional family because we all want to stand against just injustice and we do depending on how we define it. We all, another way to say this is we all today long for justice. But the problem in our culture today is that unless God exists, We have no basis for justice. We have no basis for saying this is unjust and this is just, this is right and this is wrong. But here in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus provides both the answer and the biblical basis for justice when Jesus says, I'm coming again. And it will be nothing compared to the flood. Because I will judge every ounce of injustice, whether it's personal, whether it's systemic, every ounce of evil, every ounce of sin. And the tragedy in Jesus' words here in Matthew 24 is that in that day, in that coming day, people will be just as unprepared as they were in Noah's day. The second thing, Jesus is the greater Noah. Noah points to Jesus. Jesus is the greater Noah who doesn't build a wooden ark, but ascends a wooden cross, the ultimate ark, dying for our injustice, our sin, so that all who believe will find safety, security, and refuge in the coming storm. And the storm is coming. I mean, Noah and his family of eight were physically protected by God in the ark. But Jesus Christ died to deliver all of us not just physically, but spiritually from the coming judgment. But it's not just eight. It's multitudes and multitudes from every tongue and every tribe who believe in Jesus. Education doesn't matter. Background doesn't matter. Ethnic origin, it doesn't matter who believe in Jesus. The ark was four stories high, a football field and a half long. But who can measure, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, the width, the length, the height and the depth of Jesus' love as he hung for you on the cross. Jesus is your ark. 
He is your new beginning. Not just the moment you come to Christ, but each and every day of your life. Third, Jesus is the greater Noah because Jesus knows your every need. Now we're going to look at 2 Peter. And I want you to see 2 Peter chapter 2 and just two verses. And see what Peter says about Noah and about us. Verse 5. If God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but he uh, uh, protected Noah, and here it is, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, that would be his family, and skip down to verse 9. Then, then, as a result of that, as a consequence of that, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. There it is. And to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Now we were with some of you in this service Friday night. And one of my main takeaways is how significant the trials of some of you are going through physically. Financially with family, with people you care about. How, and, how we, and we didn't experience this on Friday night, but how easy it is, as, and Katie was talking about this earlier, for us to get discouraged because we're under stress, because life seems overwhelming. And uh, suddenly we find ourselves thinking, is God ignoring me? I've been praying, where is God? I, I have a 33-year-old daughter. I think she's 33 who's involved in the foster care system in California, and it's just been incredibly difficult. And a couple weeks ago, she said to me, Dad, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm in the Word, I'm in uh, a a Bible study, but I'm really struggling because it feels like God's ignoring me. And some of you are right there right now. And in 2 Peter, we have a promise. that God knows how to rescue the godly. Take that promise and apply it to your life. God knows how to rescue you. And to say God knows is to say God will rescue you as he sees fit. Now maybe he'll bring a trial to conclusion or maybe he'll carry you in his arms through this trial. Uh, When Rhonda's first husband and my first wife were dying of cancer and uh, eventually died. That period in our lives was just horrific. It was horrific for our family. But both of us independently had this sense of of peace and, and comfort in the midst of the pain, in the sovereignty of God, because we knew that God was carrying us and God was, was growing us in the ark of his love. Do you take refuge in that ark? Not in what you see, but what you don't see. The good news of the gospel is Jesus Christ is your heart. Come to him. And cling to him. Because at the core of reality is an ever-expanding love for humanity and for the universe through what God has done for us in his son. Jesus is your ark. Cling to him. Let's pray. Father, what we have just studied, we have sung, that you are our shelter in time of storm. I pray for these men and women, I pray for these students, that that would be increasingly true, that we would know that existentially, we would know that experientially, we would know that in our hearts. Because we see the beauty of the greater Noah, Jesus himself. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me? Now unto the king, 
eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Wheaton Bible Church, you are sent. We'll have some prayer, members of our prayer team down in front, and they would love to pray with you.